Turn on everlasting God, we thank you for this day and for this unique moment in our lives and, and in this, the life of your kingdom. We've gathered together in this place from our various life circumstances and various stages in our own life journey. And God, in this one single moment, many tributaries flowing into this one river of life, God, we, we ask you for the unction of your spirit to take us into encountering with your word, your word in tension with our lives to be transformative, that we can become less of me and more like thee, empowering as we interface with an imperfect world and yet to go forth with a testimony of a perfect savior. So God, we just pray that you would connect with us as we are. It's the only way we can come. And in you is our only hope of being any different, being any better, and living lives that matter and have meanings, even eternal meanings, and any hope for the healing of our wounds and a joy unspeakable. This is our prayer, God, and we ask it in the matchless name of Jesus. We pray and give thanks. Everybody say amen. 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 As you grab your Bibles, um, or look upon the screen, and even if you look upon the screen each week, um, I do encourage you still to bring your Bibles because you never know when the technology is going to go out. and We have to go manual, the old-fashioned way, so... Um, no soldier should go to battle without their weapon. Now, some people, I realize, have it on their phone, so um, that's okay as well. So turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, the uh, fourth chapter, the 13th through the 18th verses. 1 Thessalonians, uh, the first, uh, First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, the 13th through the 18th. Uh, verses. As you're turning, touch your neighbor and say, I need a word today. <laughs> I'm reading from the same NIV version as you see in front of you. Every now and then, my I will intentionally replace. NIV language with King James language because I was raised on the King James and sometimes that old Elizabethan English just sounds more exalted. And uh, even though more recent versions like NRV are intended to cut through the thick language of that old Elizabethan English and grant us greater clarity. So if you see me drift off into other language, I'm not having a moment. I'm just... <laughs> Amen. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of people who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive are left to the coming of the Lord and will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a loud shout, and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Amen. Scripture as it is written, may God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and each other. Take your neighbor, take a neighbor by the hand and say to them, neighbor, be comforted in knowing he's coming back. Hmm. Um, 
our, um, my subject this morning in this third um, installation of uh, Linton long, uh, Linton season long sermon series that I'm doing on moving forward. And this is moving forward part three. The first was on the woman at the well, the second was at the brother of the pool. Today's installment is subtitled Comfort for the In-Between Time. Comfort for the In-Between Time. Can you repeat that? Comfort for the In-Between Time. See, some of y'all, you got off rhythm because you got ahead of me. Comfort for the In-Between Time. That was nice. This past week we had a meeting of the executive subcommittee of the Board of Directors for the American Baptist Seminary of the West that goes by the acronym ABSW. We did it uh, by, it was a phone conference and um, the president of the board of directors, who is also the president of uh, the chairperson of the executive committee, the Reverend Dr. Marsha Patton, who is as well our executive minister of the Evergreen Baptist Association. Before she called the meeting to order, she wanted to make three prayer requests. The first one was for a woman named uh, Carolyn. Carolyn Matthews is a 62 year old African American woman who has been a 20 plus year employee of the American Baptist Seminary of the West. She started off as an administrative aide. Um, somewhere along the line, she herself enrolled in the school, matriculated into the program, got her master's of divinity degree, has been preaching and teaching in various capacities while she still remains a employee of the seminary. She is that get it done person. She's or otherwise said that on every job there's that person who is the glue that holds it all together in every office. There's that one person regardless of what their title is. They've emerged as the person that she's the hub that holds all the spokes together. Without them the whole office can fall apart because they do what's on their job description then the other 90 percent of the things that they do. Carolyn is the engine behind the American Baptist Seminary of the West in terms of their administrative operation. And Marsha asked for prayer for her because last Thursday, out of nowhere, on just a regular routine checkup, she found out she was diagnosed with breast cancer in more aggress in a more advanced stages in a very virulent and radical strain. And she has immediately gone on medical leave. Uh, for an indefinite period of time as she engages in the fight for her life and what this fight will mean for the rest of her life. Right behind that, she asked for prayer for Gary. Gary is a 67-year-old white male who has been in the employ of the school for almost 40 years. Um, Gary had a heart attack five years ago came back to work, but everyone noticed he never quite the s became the same. Not the same level of physical viability, and even mentally he seemed at times to fade in and out of a clear mindedness, and he submitted his resignation recently under doctor's orders that he has to stop working immediately to attend to himself. He, he is at risk uh, of cardiac arrest if he continues to work and because he's been a custodian all these years uh, working for a graduate uh, institution but himself having only a high school diploma in fact a GED um, he loved his job but he, he has no extended family his retirement resources are but a pittance of what it will take for him to actually live on without suffering economic decimation you know, it's sad when you work your whole life and then you retire to poverty. And so the school is now trying to figure out how to support this faithful employee forced into retirement who was not financially ready in any means to 
be in retirement and to save his life and yet the biggest threat post retirement will be the stress of how to keep a roof over his head. And then she asked for prayer for a 27 year old student Syrian of Syrian background who um, is, uh, has a visa to be in the country and who was previous to last week was stressed out about this new travel ban and how often he would be able to see his family, his mother, his father, his siblings. Um, and that stress as of the latter part of last week uh, was no more and it was placed with the, replaced with the sorrow of having learned that his entire family was killed in collateral damage in the ongoing civil war in Syria. And now he is literally here alone and has no home, no loved ones to go back to. These are the prayer requests before we called the meeting to order. And so while the meeting was going on, I was understandably distracted, still processing these weighty prayer requests that came in. And I began to process them through the, the, the lens, the filter of this audacious theme we've been pushed by and challenged by and prodded by through this Lenten season of going forward. And I, Priscilla, I started to ask myself, I wonder what this theme, how it would be heard in the ears of either of the three of these individuals. What does going forward mean to a 62-year-old woman who suddenly discovers she has breast cancer in advanced stages and a virulent strain? What does going forward mean to a 67-year-old man who has a history of heart problems and now is forced into retirement, doesn't have anything really to retire on? And what does going forward mean to a millennial from another country, foreign born, with uncertain status in this country, but doesn't really matter anymore now, at least not for the moment, because he has no family to go home to or to live for? How do you hear the words going forward? And it reminded me of one of the most important and psychologically emotionally stabilizing tenets of our faith as, as Howard Thurman used to articulate it in his own colloquial version of it. He says, sometimes we have to look toward things eternal to be strengthened to deal with the matters of time. Sometimes we have to look toward things eternal if we're going to find the strength, the resolve, the capacity, even the will to deal with the matters of time when we're facing things in this life for which there is no legislative act that will matter. There is no constitutional amendment that can touch it. There is no public policy that is relevant. There's no social program that can reach it. There is no act, collective act of will that matters. There is no, no, no treasure, no wealth, no resource of anything in this world that can help you to be strengthened to deal with what you're dealing with in this world. That times in life we have to look beyond this world to find the strength to deal with what we're dealing with in this world. And that is, that is one of the driving lessons of the experience of the first century church in Thessalonica. A church which was wrestling with two disturbing theological questions. The first of which is, why the delay in Christ's return? what they called then the, per the parousia, or the parousia, some would pronounce that little Greek word that refers to when Christ returns. And as we saw in our passage from Acts, where the Lord, we see the ascension of Christ to go be back at the right hand of the Father. For we know, if we look in first, in the first chapter of St. John, that uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. We beheld his, his, and we beheld his glory, and the same Word that God who was preexistent came down to be with us in flesh, and he went back to be with the right hand of the Father. And, and as the angel said, the same one is going up, he's going to come back again. 
but they expected his immediate return, Shelton. They, they, those first century saints absolutely literally believed he was coming back within the span of their lifetime because they took literally what Jesus said at the institution of the Lord's Supper. And he says, some of you will not taste death until the Son of Man comes again in his glory. To them in their hearing, and sometimes as, as inspired as we are, sometimes our hearing is, 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 is flawed. And, and in their flawed hearing, they understood that as he will be here before I fall to the sleep of death. And now some 40 years later, he hasn't come back. Critics and cynics of the faith have said, see, you were hoodwinked, you were took, you were conned, you were had, you were swindled, you were bamboozled. It was a hoax. They're fending off the outside criticisms of the faith as well as dealing with their own faith crisis and their doubts about why the delay in Christ's return. And the second question closely related to that that flows out of that, what, and that is, what is the hope for those who die before the Lord's return? If we expected the Lord to come while we were still here in the flesh, then those who couldn't last that long, does, is it canceled for them? Do they lose their celestial visa? Is it just for those who are alive? These were pressing, prodding ur questions of the most urgent matter to church who, to saints who were struggling in that church, persecuted in worldly terms and dealing with these theological, these serious theological issues. Then to the former question of why the delay in Christ's return a definitive answer was given in 1 Peter 3 and 9 when it says, God is not slack. According to his promise, as some men count slackness. It says, for God is not, uh, God is not slack as some men count slackness, but he is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into the knowledge of the truth. And then closely tied to that, you see 2 Timothy 2 and 4, and going forward, it says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all people to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. What truth? There is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all and shall be testified of in due time. And you put them together in the aggregate, what it's saying there in many other places, is that if you want to know why the Lord hasn't come back soon and it applied to them, 40 years after the resurrection of Christ and to us 2,000 plus years after the resurrection of Christ is that maybe Jesus is waiting because somebody's not yet saved. I mean, if you think about it, if he came on yesterday, there's a whole lot of folks who weren't ready. And maybe somebody even in here today within the sound of my voice, you came to church, but you have yet to come to Christ. And you're within the arm reach of Jesus, but you're still sinking. And it's sad to sink, but it's even sadder to sink in the arm reach of Jesus and a place to hear about him, but you just won't listen. Hmm. So they came to the conclusion, the way they understood to make sense of the delay in the Lord's return is to say that Jesus is waiting. I don't know who, because we can dress up a whole lot of stuff with shirts, shirts and suits and ties, and we can sometimes become so churched, which means external conformity to the mores and the protocols of, of a religious institution, and yet our hearts not touch the cross and so Jesus is waiting look at the person to your right or left he may be waiting on them he may have held it up waiting on them that's the shame but that's the good news that you matter that much that the Lord is waiting on you But here in 1 Thessalonians, our passage for the morning, the fourth chapter, 13 through the 18 verses, we, we have the definitive answer to the latter of those two questions, which was, what about the dead in Christ? What of them? And the apostle Paul says here, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant regarding those who've fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of people who have no hope we believe that Jesus Christ died and he rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have already fallen asleep in him according to the Lord's own word we tell you that we who are still alive who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep 
For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. I like that, because that's a long time. Forever. It means there's no expiration date. The Lord forever. Therefore, he says, and this is the part I like, encourage one another with these words. That we, who are, we who are going through in this life are to be encouraged with the words that he's coming back and, and we're going to be with him forever. He says, encourage one another with these words. This passage is written as both a comfort and as well a caution for saints living in the in-between time. What I mean by the in-between time, Sister Catherine, in-between time, between the, between the time that the Lord went up and the time he comes back down. What we call the age of the church, the church age, the age of the Holy Spirit. God the Father created. God the Son redeemed what the Father created. God the Holy Spirit dwells within what the Son redeemed of what the Father created that had fallen. Then people say it's a spirit-filled church. Ain't but one kind of church, and that's the church in which the Holy Spirit dwells within the hearts of the believers of Christ. Every church, if it's a church, is a Pentecostal church. Because it's the dwelling presence of, of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the believers in Christ as the Son of God. That makes it a church that we are literally more than the aggregate of human parts. It is all us plus the Holy Ghost that makes us a church. And we're in the church age from the time that the Son went up to be back at the right hand of the Father to the time that the Son comes back down. It's the age of the church. It's the in-between time. And the in-between time can be a mean time there are people out there preaching and teaching that if we just if we're really faithful and love the Lord and know the Lord just right that somehow or another we'll be spared the pain the panic the trouble the trial the incoherence the discontinuities of life anybody who's run with the Lord a little while has learned it. there's a whole lot of people who are faithful and love the Lord still get cancer you don't take a hold of cancer cancer takes a hold of you Still have children born with birth defects. Amen. Still come home from a foreign battlefield with half a body and half a mind trying to figure out a new normal and how to go forth with life without the benefit of a full body, a full complement of limbs and the full functioning of your mind. Still people running from pillar to post. And sometimes to deal with the things in time, we have to look toward eternity. Now, maybe this don't matter to y'all, because maybe your life is just so dressed up. you got so much disposable income. Your family is so perfect and so unified. Your children are so well-behaved, and your health is so without blemish. That perhaps in your little private promised land, your little silo, that just don't seem relevant to you, but there are people who are dealing with, with unresolved matters of life, with limbs that won't grow back, with loved ones who have died who are not coming back, with failed states and countries that have no chance of any time soon being rebuilt, living in lives of utter calamity, and the only way to get up in the morning and have the strength to want to get up and the strength to take another step and not take your life of somebody else's. They've got to look beyond this world to eternity to deal with the challenges facing them in time. I, a few years ago, I, I was blessed. Y'all got time for this? If you think with me now, you may shout with me later. It's, and I'm, I'm going to try not to be too long because you know I, I'm known for brevity and I don't like to be long-winded. Can I get a witness? Please? <laughs> you know, the best compliments are the ones you don't deserve. <laughs> they feel good anyway. <laughs> and and we, we were in a, a 16th century cathedral in Macau, China. That's the southeast uh, section of China. And it was built by the Catholic missions 
philosophers of the 16th century led, in that instance, by Matau Riki. Matau is the Portuguese pronunciation of Matthew. Um, and Matau Riki and others, they built that cathedral as part of their Christian missions in the 16th century. And in the architectural theology of the, the place, they, it, it, it underscored that we as Christians, as believers in Christ, will all live in one of, in all live in each of three dimensions. Each of three dimensions. The first dimension, the one that we all in here now, are, are saints in battle. Saints embattled, the pews. He said, those who sit in the pews are saints embattled. If you're still breathing, if you're still here, if you're this, on this side of Jordan's chilly waters, you are embattled. And if you look at the church musicology throughout its history, we have songs like, I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Onward Christian soldiers marching on to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Mommy, you remember how the elders of Bethlehem used to sing back in the days when they had processions? And they would sing, you know, with sassiness. They, we are in the procession. We are soldiers. And the men would come in, in the army. In the army have to fight, we have to fight. Although we have to cry, we have to hold up, we have to hold up. The bloodstained band have to hold up, we have to hold it up until. Then when I got the choir stand, they do a military pivot. Oh, we are soldiers. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was good church back then. <laughs> Folk were serious. They saw themselves as soldiers in the army. Soldiers fighting under the flag of Christ that had been staked in their hearts and they're fighting to defend the flag. Not the star-spangled bar and stars and stripes. No, in that capacity, it was the saints of God of every age and every place in battle. Embattled with powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. Embattled with the imperfections of a fallen, as being fallen creatures in a fallen creation. Embattled with the pull of their own sin nature and their own feet of clay. Embattled with pressures and, and pain of our mortal day to existence. Embattled with the, with the, the, the agony of the, the, the crumbling and the dissolving of their own earthly tabernacles, sickness and, and time and age, eating away, stealing the vitalities of body and mind till there's nothing left. Embattled every day, fighting to put a roof over my head, food on my table, fighting to deal with the pressures that are pulling the family apart at the seams, embattled with the forces of foot in our neighborhood, turning neighbor against neighbor, embattled with the madness of this world that, that has 21 million refugees running from pillar to post, trying to find a cover, a corner to sleep in, and a crust of bread. Embattled. Each of us in our own way. If you're here today to be human, this you're fighting just to keep yourself together, fighting just to deal with the vicissitudes of life, fighting. You know, this thing of being human and not fighting, fighting even with your own fears and doubts and wonders and demons, fighting. But we have to fight although we have to cry because we just want to be happy. We're in battle, he said, but then also that, that battle comes to cease when we become saints in waiting. We fall to the sleep of death with those who have also died waiting on the Lord, but the Lord ain't came, so we die in the Lord waiting. Waiting, and the Bible tells us, in, the, in Luke tells us in, in his gospel, before he gets to the book of Acts, he tells a story about Dives and the, and the rich man. And the rich man, he says, uh, poor man laid at his gate and the rich man came every day and, and wouldn't even leave him crumbs. He was so indifferent, so selfish. And the poor man just laid at the gate and he offered him nothing. And I don't know what he said to the man that, you know, 
you ought to get up and get a job. I don't know what he said to the man. He's probably, if I gave him anything, he's probably going to use it for drugs. I don't know what he said to him. I don't know what he did to numb his conscience of no response. But the text says that in the justice of God, when they died, there was a strange juxtaposition of fortunes. It said that, that the rich man woke up in hell, begging for somebody to just stick their fingers in some water and let them lick a few drops of water for relief. Couldn't find none. And, uh, but the poor man woke up, he says he woke up in the bosom of Abraham. The bosom of Abraham was in people's understanding of the in-between when you are falling asleep and before the Lord actually returns, you, you ain't totally in heaven, but you ain't here no more. He says, you woke up in the bosom of Abraham as if your head is against Abraham's breast, waiting. Saints, no longer in battle, but he ain't come back yet, so in waiting, waiting with my head against, not the bosom of Jesus, but the bosom of Abraham, in waiting. For many of you here, your mamas, your, your daddies, your grandmamas, granddaddies, some of the elders who spoke into your life, they are no longer in battle. You are, but they're in waiting. Waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for that great getting up moaning. I didn't say morning, I said moaning. <laughs> Gotta say it right. If you're overly enunciating, you don't know what you're talking about. There's a difference between the Lord and the Lord. He's the Lord in Bible study and in a theology class. He's the Lord in the middle of the night. You call on the Lord in a sick room. And when you're about to go next before the judge, you want the Lord. <laughs> the waiting ends when the triumphant return of Christ comes. Eh. I like the way Spafford put it. Low haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds will be rolled back like a scroll. The trumpet shall sound. The Lord shall descend. Then it'll be well with my soul. Amen. When the Lord comes with a shout and the blast of a trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise. It's going to be a procession. There's going to be order to it. Out of courtesy, the dead in Christ, those who've been waiting the longest, they get to go first. Seems like only polite. And then we who are still here, then it's our turn. And we shall be with him forever. I didn't say forever, I said forever. And ever. And ever. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. And so here in, 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 1 Thessalonians, this fourth chapter, and 13th to the 18th verse of the, the text in front of us. He lets us know that speaking not to the triumphant saints, not to the saints in waiting, it ain't relevant to them. Whatever they're going to get, they got. But for those of us who are still in battle, and I don't know what you're fighting, I, you don't know what I'm fighting, but we're fighting. Amen. Touch your neighbor and say, keep fighting. Amen. Whether you feel like you win or losing, just keep fighting. Amen. Just stay in the fight. And every time you feel like jumping out the ring, just get on back in there, just stay in the fight. I remember watching, I was watching Rocky II the other day, and I was watching Rocky Balboa, and, and Apollo Creed was whooping him something terrible, and, and, and Mickey was in the corner, he said, Rocky, get up! Rocky, Rocky, get up! Sometimes as a Christian, you just, get up, man, get up, get up. He's driving me crazy, get up! These kids are getting on my nerves, get up! I ain't got no money. I'm tired of money. Press. Get up, saints of God. Get up. Keep fighting. Onward, Christian soldiers. The soldiers in God's army, we got to fight. Although we got to cry. Sometimes you got to fight and cry and cry and fight. In fact, you better be careful with them people who are slinging snot and tears and fighting because they crazy. They'll hurt you. In fact, you ain't even ready to fight till you got a mingling of snot and tears. Now you're ready. Put some Vaseline on your face. Pull your hair back. Now you're ready. Whether it's the devil or that fool in your house that you're tired of. Just get you some Vaseline and keep on fighting. Have I got a witness, Beverly?
This text is teaching us that while we are embattled, it's designed to provide us, first of all, comfort. Comfort. Can you put up there 2 Corinthians 4th chapter, the 17th to the 18th verses? Because there's an audacious thing that Paul says, and many people have taken offense at it. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. How dare you, Paul? trivialize our pain and refer to this hell as light affliction. Tell me what is light about being a black woman in Nigeria captured by the Boko Quran and forced to be a sex slave for some maniacs who talk about God but they can kill and rape and murder without thinking about it. How dare you refer to the plight of 21 million refugees in this world who've gotten a squat in the corner just to relieve themselves of the normal bodily functions. And many in refugee camps die of exposure to human waste. How dare you refer to that as light afflictions? How dare you refer to the soldiers that have come home from war without an arm or a leg, want love and relationship and family and children like everybody else, but you try to compete in the love market with half a body and dependent upon medication for the rest of your life just to be even in your mentality. How dare you refer to some Tennessee coal miner who's got black lung working in them coal mines and now worried about if Congress and they're trying in their attempts to repeal and replace might take away the benefit that they got through Obamacare. What is light about that? Understand, my brothers and sisters, when Paul here talks about our light tribulations, he is not trying to trivialize our pain. Oh, no. See, Paul understands that it's, it's, the pain's there. It ain't going nowhere. The challenge is, are we going to be able to manage it? And pain management is about perspective. Those who can't get perspective on their pain jump out windows. They hurt themselves or hurt somebody. They, in the most extreme forms, they can be homicidal or suicidal all at the same time. And then somebody else can live gracefully with the same pain. And what's the difference between those who jump out the window or pull the trigger on themselves or somebody else and those who just keep putting one foot in front of the other? The difference is perspective. And what Paul is trying to say is that what makes these afflictions light and momentary, um, what makes them light is that they're only momentary. And what makes them momentary is that eternity comes behind them. Which is not meant to trivialize our troubles, but rather to put them into some helpful perspective. You see, uh, let me give you a window of application. Several years ago, I was going out of town, some church-related business. I, I rented a car to get from the airport to the hotel in the city. I had barely moved off the rental car lot, and there was this nagging, loud noise coming from under the hood. I didn't know what it was, or the car was about to break down. It seemed to be running smoothly, but the noise was like fingers on a chalkboard. So before I really hit the highway, I turned right about, right around, went back to the airport, and I said, this car, there's a strange sound. And, and the man said, okay, let me go hear it. He went to the car, turned it on, and he said, yep, it's there. I said, well, can a brother get another car? I can't stand that noise. He said, we don't have no more cars. That's the last one. I said, well, what am I going to do? He said, well, you got two choices. You can turn it in the car and get around the best way you can. Or you can take the car. I said, but I don't want to listen to that noise. He said, what you going to do? You got two choices. You can turn it in the car, get around the best way you can, or you can deal with the noise. I said, I can't stand there. I started complaining about the noise. And he looked at my paperwork. He said, sir, you're only going to have the car two days. And I thought, okay, two days. I can deal with this. I got in the same car with the same noise. It was still just as irritating. But I was less preoccupied with it because I realized after two days, I'll be done with it. And sometimes it's a matter of perspective. Is the glass half empty or half full? It has to do with, it has to do with perspective. And, and, and somebody's sitting here saying, yeah, Reverend, that's fine. Uh, you know, you only had to deal with a broke down car for two days, but I'm dealing with a heartache or a pain or a situation that's going to be with me the rest of my natural days. A limb severed, lost. It ain't growing back. A loved one died. They're not coming back. A chronic illness that defines my possibilities every day. That's a lot longer than two days, and yes, it is. It may be that, may be the fact, it may be true. However, 
Even when you take the rest of your life, if there's no remittance to your situation, however long the rest of your life turns out to be, if it's a week or if it's 80 years, if and when it's placed alongside eternity, even the rest of your life is next to nothing. Therefore, the troubles we experience along the line in the rest of our life, they're light, which literally means small potatoes, because they're light, because they're momentary. When you place it alongside eternity, that's the way, that's why we can say trouble don't last always because as you can't take money with you on the other side of the grave, your problems can't chase you on the other side of the grave. Cancer can't go with you. Emphysema can't go with you. Your addictions can't go with you. Your heartache, cares will be all past when we're home at last. Sometimes we need to look toward eternity to deal with what we're facing in time. There's a lady in my church in Buffalo. She lost a leg to sugar. A lot of people, that don't make no sense. To younger people, that don't make no sense. To black folk over 50, that's the way we used to refer to diabetes. It was sugar. <laughs> Grandmama, with her legs, she, she had sugar. We used to call it sugar diabetes. <laughs> she lost a leg to sugar. And... Uh, took two deacons with me, and then I learned on that day I needed to do some deacon training because everybody don't know how to visit the sick. Now, the deacons here at, at New Beginnings know how to visit the sick. They knew how to visit the sick, but in First Shadows, there was something that didn't know how to visit the sick because one deacon, you know, sometimes people believe, well, they got to say something. Somebody starts crying or feeling bad. I got to say something. No, sometimes you just need to shut up and just be with them. Sometimes we need the wisdom and the strength to not say nothing. You ain't God. They know it, but they do appreciate you being there with them. But he was looking for the magic words, and, and, and he opened his mouth. And he should have had a better bedside manner because he was a dentist. So Sheila knows what I'm talking about. But don't say his name because the world's a smaller place than what you think. But this fool, I mean, I didn't mean to say that. This, this man. This man said to this lady in a wheelchair who lost a leg to sugar, he says, don't worry about it. Just pray, and you'll be back on your feet in no time. And I looked at him like, really? Really? Of all the things you could have said. The woman started to wailing and to crying. And, and then the other deacon, and I was trying to think, to jump in there, and before I could, uh, Deacon Pleasant Thomas, who himself would lose a foot to some strange blood disorder about 10 years later. But he said to her, he said, Mother Johnson, Mother Johnson, he said, listen, listen. He said, I, I know it's rough. He said, but look at it this way. He said, you will only have to live without that leg for the rest of this life. Amen. And she looked at him. A strange sense of calm as if he put it, he didn't change anything. But it put it in perspective and she says, yeah, that is true. She began to find the strength to pull it together and discover a new normal and to live on without that leg and be glad for what was left. Garner Taylor used to talk about the experience of dealing with families who stand beside the grave and see that cold box with the cold remains of their loved one and a cold hole in the ground that soon will be filled with that box and covered over with dirt. And he said, only then, in that moment, no government policy matters, no legislation matters, no social justice agenda, no, no public policy, no treasures of this world matter for rich or poor. All stations of life are rendered irrelevant at that moment. It's just loss. It's the only thing that matters in that moment is whether or not one has the assurance of the Beulah land. Beulah land is a word that comes out of Isaiah 62 and 4 where it talks about the land that uh, God granted to Israel. He referred to it as the Beulah land. Beulah literally means married, Philip. The land that was given to those who were married to God in covenant. And the church in the New Testament is referred to as the bride of Christ. We're engaged to the Lord and the marriage ceremony will happen in that great getting up morning. Did you know that we're all engaged? Some of you sisters who've been waiting to get engaged, well, spiritually, you're already engaged. <laughs> you 
say, I want a different kind of engagement. <laughs> We are the bride of Christ waiting for the groom at the great wedding feast. And, 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 and Gardner Taylor says it's in the Beulah land. I like the way he poetically says it's over in the Beulah land where we will be reunited with our loved ones that we've lost, lost a while in love since. David would say in one place when his child died, he said, I cannot bring them back, but I will go to be with them. In the Beulah land. For those who are married to the Lord, we have when we face death in its chilly waters. We can understand why Paul can say, Death, where's your sting? Grave, you have no victory. Why? Because Jesus at his cross, by his power of his death and resurrection, took the sting out of death. And the grave, it's victory because they are set apart from me, but only for a little while. They're just waiting. On the great marriage feast. There's a difference between losing something forever and knowing that you get it back. It softens it. It takes the sting out of it. Come on, help me somebody. And, and it, it even changes the definition. When you know you're going to see them over in the Beulah land, they're not lost to you. Because the only time something is lost is when you don't know where it is. But if you know that they're waiting in the bosom of Abraham to join the Lord with you in the air, then you know they're not lost. They're just waiting for a great getting up morning we don't weep as others who have no hope that's why Paul would say if in this life only we have hope we among all men would be most miserable but we're not miserable we have a joy this world didn't give to us and this world including death cannot take it away because I know what's waiting for me who's waiting for me over in uh, Beulah land. But this passage, not only does it give us comfort, and he says, comfort each other with these words. Every funeral, comfort each other by saying, he coming back. Every tragedy, comfort each other. Every divorce, comfort each other. Every tragedy with your child, comfort each other. Every funeral of a, love, of a young person taken down by gang fire or the police, comfort each other every crazy terrorist act comfort each other every scar to body and soul comfort each other look beyond this world to deal with the mess of this world but it not only comforts us it cautions us it is a caution to embattled saints to be comforted but also cautioned put up there second corinthians 5 and 10 second corinthians 5 and 10 it talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Um, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, don't get stressed out here and thinking that somehow or another we must work for righteousness, work for our relationship with God. No, 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 the Bible is very clear. We are saved only through the blood of Jesus. He has atoned for our sins. He has atoned for our sins. But put, put, put up there, I know I didn't tell you this one before, put up there Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12. I want to make sure that you don't wander theologically into the notion of works righteousness. Can you imagine being burdened every day with the need to try and be good enough today to stay saved? That's when people say to me, Reverend, I want to be rebaptized. Rebaptized suggests that you need to be born again, again. <laughs> I am my mother's child every day since August 2nd, 1961. No matter how mad she get with me, I'm still a child. The only question is, are we in fellowship or not in fellowship? But the fact that I was born to her, I can never not be hers. Say amen, mama. She said, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 103, 10 said, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he has removed our transgressions from us. The good thing about east and west, because you go that way for, 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 
That way for west, that way for east, they can never touch. And he's saying to us as believers, our sins can never touch us anymore because the Lord has atoned for them in his cross. And he said to Thessalonians, another place, he says, we are sealed to the day of the Lord's appearing, which means the Lord's got the title deed to our soul and the devil can't pry his fingers loose. We have to struggle against the proclivities of our sin, but our status before God is once saved, always saved. Baptism is the hallmark, the, it is the emblem, is the badge of covenant. So it is to say to the world, you've been saved and you never have to be saved again. You may need to be renewed in faith. You may need to be restored in fellowship, but you don't have to become born again again. You just need to clean yourself up. And, and, and so what is the, this, when, when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ is not about the eternal destiny of believers. That has already been established. It's not about the judgment of our sins. It, it, it's, that has been resolved once and for all in the cross. But the judgment seat of Christ is where believers will be rewarded for the degree of faithfulness and service. It is where God will judge our works, what we do in his name after salvation. Put up 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, 10th, 12th, and 13th verse. 1 Corinthians, the, the, the third chapter, the 10th, 12th, and the 13th verse says, By grace God has given me, I, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. Be careful. Somebody say, be careful how you build. If any man builds on this foundation using silver, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, flip it, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. In other words, everything we do in God's name is going to be thrown into the fire, and the fire with its purging power will expose it for what it is. Sometimes we do the right thing for the wrong reason. Sometimes we come into church not to see him, but to see her. Or to see him, not with a focus on the cross, but somebody in the pew, fifth row, third seat from the end. We got other agendas. We do the right thing for the wrong reason. And, and, and Paul says there are levels of faithfulness it, just as much as there are different types of ingredients, materials that go into the building of a house. You have something as solid as the stone that forms the foundation. You have something solid but not quite as solid as the wood that frames the walls. You have, you have something that in the straw that is part of the composite for the roof that certainly burns up quick. But, but it still plays an important role. And it says that all of our work, some of the stuff we do in the Lord's name is solid solid like a rock. Some stuff is solid, but not quite as solid like wood. And some stuff is like stubble. It's a bunch of mess. He said, every man needs to be careful on what you're putting into God's house because in the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be discerned the motivations behind what we do and the quality of the work we've done in his name since we've been saved. In other words, we're not saved to sit, we're saved to serve, and that service will be judged. Our status, our destiny has been assured, but, but the, the judgment upon our service, well, what, what, what does this mean? Let me give you a window of application. I go to a lot of commencement exercises as, as, as a pastor pastor um, each year and, and at commencement exercises everyone who marches in cap and gown is graduating am I right the A students the B students the C students the D A students the B students the C's everybody who's marching in cap and gown is graduating but some of the graduates sister Deneen uh, have asterisks by their name for special recognition you have the honor roll students and you have the uh, uh, valedictorians, the salutatorians, and other people get special distinction. They're all graduating, but even within the graduating class, there are special distinctions. Can I make it a little bit plainer? Uh, when I look at my own family, all of us have graduated from college. Now, now Car Car uh, Sheila and Carissa graduated magna cum laude. That's them people who got 3.7 or above. Magna cum laude. The, them is the people that the professors know by first name, magna cum laude. Sam graduated cum sum laude. That's what them people do, three, five, three, six, and, and above. And me, I graduated, thank you, laude. I didn't do so well. 
I did back, I, I met the Loudies in graduate school, but in undergraduate school, when it came to commencement, I was just glad to be there. I had a cap and a gown. I turned my tassel like everybody else, but I had no asterisk by my name. And it made me mad. And I said, when I get into graduate school, if I get in, and by the grace of God, I get in, I said, the next time I cross that stage, my name's going to be separated out in them special categories. I'm going to get me some asterisk by my name. I'm going to be on them shorter lists because I not only want to graduate, I want some special recognition. I want to graduate one of them cum laude's. And that's what Paul was getting at when he talked in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, when he said, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my deliverance is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. And now I'm not only going to heaven, but when I get there, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness at the day of my Lord's appearing. I'm not just graduating on that great getting up morning, but when I get there, I'm on that special special list because I get a crown of life because I have been there in season and out of season. I stood the test. I went the extra mile. I turned the other cheek. I blessed those who cursed me. I did good to those who despitefully used me. Lord, I let you pour me in. I let you fill me up and pour me out and fill me up and pour me out and fill me up and pour me out until I have nothing more to get and now I am ready to meet you when you come. And that's all Paul was saying is be ready. How many of you want to be ready when the Lord comes? In spite of the hell and the heartache we deal in this life, the issue is to be ready when he comes so that you get some special distinctions. How many want to get to heaven and be magna cum laude, cum assume laude? You want to meet them laudes, not only on earth, but in heaven. You want some laude to your testimony. You want the Lord to give you some laude. Let me say that again. You want the Lord to give you some laude. Touch your neighbor. I said, well, I want some laude from the Lord. When I meet him, I want to be ready. I don't want to just limp into heaven. I don't want to just crawl into heaven. When my works are thrown into the discerning fire, I want them to come forth as pure gold. I'll tell you a story and I get out your way. Listen, listen. Uh, uh, Bishop Lardy of the, not Lardy, Lardy of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, he said this, this past week when I was at the board meetings for Faith Partners Incorporated, another group I'm on the board of directors with, and he said, we were in Wilmington, Virginia, and he was telling a story about this lady in his church. She led the devotion for many years. Devotion was what they did in church before they started praise and worship. Deacons and deaconesses, when they had gender distinction in service, we kind of raised our consciousness as just deacons, male or female. And in the AME church, it was the stewards and so forth. She, she led, she could sing, so she led the, 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 the um, devotion. And he said she led it for years, but as she got older, um, her mind started to drift. And right in the middle of the song service, her mind would drift, and it made for some, some, some uncomfortable and some some kind of weird moments in service. He said, you remember one time in particular, she was up singing, yeah, I want to be ready when Jesus come. I want to be ready when Jesus come. Oh, I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Ready, ready when Jesus come. And out of nowhere, her mind left her. And she went on singing, and he'll be coming around the mountain when he comes. <laughs> He'll be coming around the mountain when he comes. Oh, he'll be coming around the mountain. He'll be coming around the mountain. He'll be coming around the mountain when he comes. And folk looked up. They're like, what? Are, are we in church at a campfire? What, what is going on? And then her mind came back, and she went right on, oblivious to what had happened. And she said, I want to be ready. Jesus, come. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to be ready. Jesus, come. I want to be ready. When Jesus come, ready, ready, when Jesus come, and her mind left again. Sister Adrian, she said, and he'll be riding six white horses when he comes. Yeah, Lord, hallelujah, he'll be riding six white horses when he comes. Oh, you'll be riding six white horses. Folk didn't know whether to sing along or stop. The pastor just went along with it and said, he'll be riding six white horses, he'll be riding six white horses, he'll be riding six white horses when he comes. And then a mind kicked right back in. She said, I want to be ready. Jesus, come. 
I want to be ready when Jesus come. Oh, I want to be ready when Jesus come. Ready, ready when Jesus come. And Beverly, her mind left her one more time. She said, and we'll all go out to meet him when he comes. <laughs> and we'll all go out to meet him when he comes. Yes, we'll all go out to meet him. We'll all go out to meet him. We'll all go out to meet him when he comes. We fell on the ground. Now we said, Bishop, you lying. He said, no, it's a true story. He said, he said, we, he said you lying. But I got back to my room that night and I started thinking. I said, she actually stumbled into the truth on that last verse. Like a broken clock that's right at least twice a day. Because we will all go out to meet him when he comes. That's all Paul was saying here. He said, with a loud shout, the trumpet shall sound, and the Lord shall descend, and the graves will give up the dead. The dead in Christ shall rise, and we who remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Paul said in another place that at that moment, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord of all. Have I got a witness? And we'll all go out to meet him when he comes. Ain't that good news? He may not be coming around no mountain, but he's coming back again. He may not be riding six white horses, but he's coming back again. And we'll all go out to meet him. Black folk going out to meet him. White folk going out to meet him. Jew and Gentile going out to meet him. So you better comfort yourself when you think you can't go on. Just look at yourself in the mirror and bless yourself by saying, self, he's coming back again in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. We shall be saved. Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. I'm going home to live with God. So if in the meantime, it's the meantime, in this in-between time, I deal with my cancer because it can't chase me to the other side of the grave. If in the meantime, I got bills due and don't know where the money's coming from, I'll just trust in the Lord. Have I got a witness? Because there's a banquet table waiting for me on the other side. If in the meantime, friends forsake me, that's all right, because one of these old days, I can see Jesus face to face. Have I got a witness? One of these old days, no more dying, no more crying, no more sickness, no more war, no more pain, no more hate, no more tragedy, no more crying and praying, praying and crying, crying and praying. Because the Lord, the Lord has moved all these things away. Somebody say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, hang on in there. He's coming back again. Touch somebody else and say, neighbor, hang on in there. He's coming back again. Put your hand on your chest and say, self, don't forget. He's coming back again. Now stand on your feet and scream. Just say, yeah. Hey, 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 hey. He's coming. Sign me up. The Christian Jubilee, write my name, write my name, write it on, on the road. 